I'm just going to get started here. I'm uh, Desikan Madhavanor. I'm uh, SVP of the Workload Automation and a few other products. Uh, and here we're going to talk about a topic that's becoming extremely critical uh, in today's application economy. So what are we talking about, right? So with the application economy, we're seeing more and more companies developing more and more software on more and more platforms and releasing them more frequently, right? So they have this really complicated, complex uh, environment to support, and they got to do it most of the time with limited, constrained budgets. So how do you do that, and how do you manage that, right? So it's about automation, and not just any kind of automation, but smart automation, where you're able to measure uh, what's happening in the environment, the events that are coming out, the performance slowdowns that are happening with various applications, bounce them against thresholds, prioritize these things, and figure out when problems are going to happen and resolve them. Because you just don't have the number of bodies and the workflows to go and uh, track every exception that happens after it has happened and have an escalation process to do that. So customers are increasingly looking at this ecosystem as a continuum. All kinds of automations are taking precedence, starting from application deployment, uh, release automation, runbook automation, managing events as exceptions happen as your storage goes down or fills up. What do you do about it? So that kind of uh, event-based automation. Dynamic configuration and placement, which is effectively if you know that your load is going to bump up, how do you get more virtual machines provision? How do you get more instances available? So a lot of that. And finally, the core... Uh, automation of data flows, core automation of workflows and application processes uh, as part of workload automation. So this is becoming more of a continuum. And the ability to track and monitor this end-to-end -end is becoming a key part of the stack that most of our customers use. So what does that mean, right? Most of you are using our automation product either on the mainframe side or on the distributed side. Whether it's an uh, application that runs uh, on, on the mainframe, it's a service that's exposed to in the distributed environment. Today, we already support end-to-end -end workloads that run in the distributed side and in the mainframe uh, already. Now, what we're seeing is two levels of complexity. One complexity is this boundary stretching even further to cover cloud-based systems that we have traditionally not automated like we do the enterprise systems. Think about a Salesforce.com that needs to get integrated with your SAP. We're talking to a lot of customers where this data is going back and forth, and a lot of that is done manually. How do you automate that? The other end, clusters, big data clusters, different kinds of jobs that need to run in a distributed environment that is managed by a Cloudera or a Hortonworks, and how do you manage that, right? So that whole ecosystem and the jobs associated with that is expanding the complexity of the jobs that you're managing, but also another level of complexity comes from how you manage it. Batch windows are getting smaller and smaller. SLAs are getting tighter and tighter. In many cases, batch windows are disappearing. And in those cases, how do you manage this on-demand traffic that you can't quite predict ahead of time? You can't model ahead of time. So what becomes important there is to layer in advanced visibility, real-time tracking of events. Agent goes down. How do you manage that? Right? A database load is way more than what it used to be. 100% over what you are traditionally used to. How do you manage that? The visibility and monitoring of the entire stack. Now, once you get that information, how do you use it? How do you extract the right information out of it? How do you use predictive analytics to forecast what this particular disruption is going to do to your entire workflow? For instance, if you're managing a billing workflow, a specific data load slowed down or is delayed, is it going to impact your generation of a bill or not? You've got to be able to understand the critical path, expand the whole flow, and figure out if it's a problem. So the forecasting and the predictive analytics to do that. And finally, the last part of this is what do you do with this uh, analysis now? Can you do something about it? Can you change your placement models? Can you, for instance, spin up more environments, increase the capacity because the load is increasing? Can you trigger a failover because you see the performance of the application is really slow? So that kind of optimal placement that is driven, the decision-making that is driven by analytics is also super key. So the complexity is both in terms of what we cover as well as how we cover it, right? So that is what's happening now increasingly. The number of customers that I visit where we talk about monitoring, SLA management, predictive analytics, 
understanding when failures happen so you can fix them before they happen. This is one of the hardest topics, uh, no matter whether you're an RSS user, CH7, ESP, D series, this is one of the most important uh, topics that gets covered, the critical path analysis, right? Now, when we look at this problem and we said, okay, let's, we have to solve this problem, right? So we start building this functionality. We look at it as layers, right? The, the lowermost is the automation layer that you have already implemented, automating the actual devices or automating workloads, be they uh, database uh, SQL queries or any kind of services. So that's the level one, layer one, which is understanding what this automation is, tracking the events, understanding when an agent is not responsive, understanding when a job is taken more time, so that part. Now on top of that, what we have layered is analytics and correlation model that does both the event management correlation, which means something has happened, sensing that something happened, taking that and prioritizing and seeing what is the impact of this. Is this something I should manage or it should be something that self-corrects, right? Should I just retry? And then how do I respond to that? So that is a event has happened, sense response model. On the other end is your measure model where you're looking at the data, you're measuring it, you're forecasting your critical path, you're bouncing it against the previous runs, and then you're coming up with a prescriptive model that says, well, nothing has happened yet, but if you don't do something, then you're, you're going to miss your SLA. There is a 90% chance that you'll miss your SLA. Now that gives you an opportunity to go in and do something about it. So that's the level two, layering in the analytics on top of the events. Now level three, another important thing is, how do you visualize it? Where do you want to put it? You already have invested in a monitoring uh, system. You have a control tower or a command center. How do we push it in there? How do you make it show up in your mobile device? So that's the next step, is the visualization, it is the notification, the escalation process. So it's another level, a layer of investment. So when we talk about SLA management, as CA, we are the only company that has a certified solution for both distributed and mainframe engines that does the whole thing. We own the engine, we own the data, we have an analytics product, and we have some of the most uh, good visualizations and notifications that we are working on right now will be way superior to anything you would have seen. So that's a big, big focus area. Now, joining me on stage right now uh, to talk about how customers are actually using it, what environment changes are happening, and uh, you know how customers are dealing with these SLA management challenges is Mark Mannion. He's uh, the managing director of Extra Technology, a, a big partner helping us implement this solution uh, mostly in Europe, but all over the world. So uh, please give him a good hand, big hand, and uh, welcome him. Great. So Mark, thanks for joining us here. And we'll start off with something very basic, right? Yes. You work with a lot of customers, a lot of industries. Uh, what is the scheduling environment looking like today as compared to maybe a few years ago, and where, is it, where do you think it's going? Well, we see... Lots more scheduling than we ever saw before. And I think that what we're seeing is we've got the traditional mainframe distributed scheduling engines, but we're seeing scheduling tools embedded within applications. Um, we're seeing more workflows than ever before. We're seeing um, manual processes being taken into those scheduling systems at a faster rate than we've seen in probably 15 years. Um, and obviously there's drivers for that which are common across all sectors. Um, I'll expect we'll touch upon that later on. Great. So let's take it to uh, the next level, right? We have both talked to a lot of customers that have expressed interest in SLA yeah. management. What is it about the environment today that makes this functionality super critical? What do customers really expect when they start thinking about SLA management in their ecosystem? I guess the most important aspect of, of, of SLA management is, is the fact that there's more stuff in the scheduling system in the first place. So we've seen, especially after the, um, you know, the, the global recession, we've seen um, customers take much more, uh, make much more focus on automating standard processes. So perhaps the biggest um, issue with regards to SLA management is there are less people monitoring those processes manually. I mean, when I started in the industry in its late 80s, early 90s, we saw um, people being paid to look at screens, people being paid to monitor the progress of a batch um, as it was called then, and um, those people don't, don't have those types of jobs anymore. They don't. People have taken those processes and brought them into scheduling tools, 
I call them work load automation tools. But um, when you take those processes into an automated system, you sometimes lose the hands-on, eyes-on um, focus that you have because certainly we don't see many uh, batch operators anymore. Even the application support people have multitasking. So we have to have people um, only being alerted at the point when there's a predicted SLA failure. And of course, that's where you need those analytic tools. Um, we've seen in the last four years probably 25% of all our meetings about anything to do with workload um, focused on SLA um, management. And perhaps the most interesting aspect of that would be that the driver isn't coming from the usual guys. So I've spent 15 years pretty much concentrating on workload. So I meet the same guys year after year after year. Um, but turning up for these meetings, the reason it's a business consideration you asked me about is because it's the business people who turn up. So it's new guys. And for, for us, maybe it's a good thing because there's new guys with new budgets and new focus. And so the real driver for us has been um, totally business related. And it's a whole new conversation for us. Um, you know, uh, my typical audience five years ago was, was the infrastructure team who were responsible for the, um, for the conversation about how I install CA7 or Autosys, how maybe I tune it up, get more out of it. Um, but those guys really, you know, we've done that, we've got there. Now they've got, a different, um, they've got a different problem to solve. They've got a problem to solve where the workflows are now in place, people are relying on those workflows, but how do we make sure that those workflows actually deliver the end product at the appropriate time? So the business considerations are exactly that. It's about the business, and that's where the conversations are happening now. So you've been one of the early adopters of iDash, and you have worked yes. with customers. So what is it about iDash that actually uh, helps customers solve these problems? What kind of reaction are you getting from the marketplace? Well, I guess the first thing, the most surprising thing about iDash is that when we went to pitch iDash the first time out, we talked about SLAs. We were very excited to talk about the way in which we could, we could set up an SLA really quickly with a wizard tool. We just we define what your end point is and then we'd find the critical path automatically. And we boasted about that an awful lot. Um, and of course, that was the original reason why most people bought iDash. What's interesting is we found that maybe 50% of those customers really are doing their analytics based on the reporting tools within iDash. And I suppose what makes iDash um, an interesting proposition is that the reports from the early days outstrip that of any sort of competitive tool. And, um, and perhaps the best part of the iDash model now, you know, for me as a CA sort of main reseller for, for UK and, and, and the biggest service partner for EMEA, is that this tool is owned by CA, the product management team is CA. Our customers, the early adopters of this, of this product post CA's acquisition, pretty much just wrote their shopping list. And we're seeing those, um, those new features coming in, you know, much earlier than we've ever expected. So I guess the key differentiator between iDash and any other product forecasting tool that we've seen, not just within the CA domain, but within other um, vendor domains, is, is the speed in which um, the product's evolving. And, and you know, with all due respect, you know, with the product management team, yourself and, and your team, we, we're seeing you out in the field. I mean, I visit my customers at least every quarter, and I'm pretty sure that Parag visits them more often than me. And that's, you know, that's quite a thing. Excellent. All right, so let's talk about the future, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you think this is going? I mean, are you talking about lights out automation where the SLAs are self-determined and problems are self-detected, decisions are made, and people are only alerted if a problem, an unsolvable problem shows up? Is that where we are headed? Or is it, do you continue to see a combination of man and machine solving this problem? Yeah. Well, certainly I think what happens with the whole um, workload analytics space is it's, I think presently people view it as a luxury and I think in the, in the medium term it will just become an essential. I just don't imagine anybody going out and buying a, a, an Autosys or CA7 solution and not just by default having the appropriate iDash bundle with it. Um, in terms of where I see things going most, I think what we're seeing with our current customer base, the existing iDash customer base, is that the customers, the business customers, the business end users are thrilled with what they're getting out of iDash and they wish they had it with their inbuilt scheduling tool. So for their, the SAP users with the inbuilt schedule function within there, they wish they had that more. So what we're seeing 
uh, and it's probably good because you've got your advanced integration program, is a concerted effort to get as much of the schedule and the workflow and all those different aspects of your, of your diagram with the automation that's been shown um, sort of being sort of propagating itself throughout the whole IT infrastructure. We're seeing that people want to have autosys running or, in, or at least having uh, an understanding of what's happening inside the apps. So I think the future is more of the same, more advancement within uh, the IDAS tool as we've got it, but actually to have more more of the visibility through autosys. And in fact, you know, even down to the point where, um, whereas we used to get all, doing all our business by making the infrastructure work, um, we found, and we're a large services provider, we found that we get called in now to look at the schedules, those, those jobs that run for four hours, well, that's just, you know, even for an SLA-based scenario, if you've got a single job that runs for four hours and it's important, how does a single job run for four hours? If we find potentially that that job involves some file movement, a database dump, and in fact it's just one big piece of code, JCL, Perl, whatever, then the logic, and maybe the future as I see it, is that people would just get rid of those big, boxy, scripted um, processes and break them down into component parts. If you look at the 11.3 version of all CA's product over the last few years, you now have all these wondrous job types. You know, you're capable of running native database jobs, native file movement jobs. And if you actually break down your processes to utilize those, those jobs, those native jobs, then you have an analytics tool which can work with a 20-phase process rather than a one-phase big blocked script. So I actually see, you know, if your career is workload and this is where you're going to, you know, you'll see out your days, you'll be interested in making sure the infrastructure is working. But I think as a, as, an, as a workflow specialist, you can take what your customers have given you and give a critique and say, you know, actually, I understand the function, I understand why you're doing this, why have you scripted it? And in fact, it's the same across the whole of automation. The more modular you make things, the better your data is, the less skilled your support staff have to be. I mean, we saw, uh, we've been to a manufacturing company who'd had a major outage which required um, a stoppage which meant a, a, a production line wasn't, wasn't, work, wasn't moving and they were losing, uh, it counted to millions. An hour's luck, luck of production line movement would result in over a million dollars worth of, um, uh, of loss. And it was because somebody very clever had written a very clever big script. And the bottom line was that when that script failed, we needed that very clever guy to be raised out of bed, sit down at his desk at home, dial in, fix the problem, not turn up the next day. And, and the bottom line was, we went in, and it was, it was the most simple job, simplest job we've ever had, is to say, do you know what? We could take this 100-line piece of code and break it into 12, 15 jobs. And, and by the way, the reason it failed was it was an FTP job that had hung, and it was about three four minutes into a four-hour process, or whatever it's supposed to be. And, and, and I bet most of you guys have seen that. You know, that something stalls, nobody understands the script. If you're lucky, the guy still works for you. And if you're unlucky, he doesn't even work for you. And you have to, you know, ham-fistedly work your way through. So the future... Oh, that's a very long answer. Apologize. <laughs> so I see the future to be, you have better workflows you get as much visibility into your main tool. So, you know, we hope it's the CA tool. You use advanced integration. You get all your workflow in one, you know, in one visible screen, broken down into modular pieces, and then you get a very sophisticated workflows analytics tool to give you all the information you need because you're not paying those guys anymore to monitor those schedules and those flows yeah. because we're saving money. Yeah, and that's a very important point. I've had one-on-one -on -one with a lot of you. And one of the recurring themes is you want to avoid those rogue automation silos that run in the SAP world or in the Hadoop world, right? Having a capability like SLA management where you can bring them in and look at them holistically is going to help you make the case as to why they should be centralized, right? So it's a big uh, opportunity to take this additional functionality and explain why SLA management can be a driver for more of your workloads being centralized. So an important point that you just made. So I'm just going to summarize a few things here, right? So the key topic that we talked about is application-aware, analytics-driven automation, right? Yeah. Where you're able to see specific issues that show up and use the data to predict if that's going to be a problem or not. And if it's a problem, how do you go about resolving it, right? So that is here to stay. 
And, and Extra Technology has been a great partner of ours, and they've worked with a lot of customers in Europe uh, to, to help create the right environment for these uh, products to be tested, validated, rolled out, right? So they've helped us do that. So some of the key findings, do you want to talk about some of your key, uh, key findings here? Just, just double checking them. <laughs> I guess the biggest thing we would say is our key findings are that everybody who's got an analytics tool is, is, is a happier and better running customer. And that's the key finding. I mean, I've, we've got some words here too, but you know, the big, I don't know a single customer who's regretted it I can, see, I can see huge cases for having more of it and, and, being, and being able to get more from the SLA tool by following through some things I mentioned. But, I mean, you know, we, we, we're the customer-facing guys who go out to hundreds of sites across EMEA delivering this stuff, and we've never, had, we've never had anything other than a very positive experience. The most important aspect of this is once we, once we get it working is to get somebody within your organization to actually evangelize and let the business know that this exists. Well, when the business know it exists, and I've seen this, it's, it's all smiles, you know. So that's my biggest finding. Great. So thanks a lot, Mark. And uh, you'll oh. all appreciate that uh, real experience implementing this product uh, in production uh, is, is, is critical. And, and it's a new product. It's being rolled out. So having someone come here and talk to you about the experiences customers are facing in the field, I'm sure you find it really valuable. I'm going to use the next minute to uh, have a quick plug to some of the sessions that I would like you guys to show up and attend. Uh, we have a detailed use case uh, for iDash that, that you're going to lead, Mark. So, so at, at so I was to, can I plug this? Because yes. so we've got an iDash expert called Anthony, um, who's co-presenting with me on this top session. Uh, you'll see there the uh, the one at 2 p.m. Um, now, the, one of the biggest difficulties we have as as CA's sort of partner here, is getting one of our customers to come along and actually speak to you about their real-life situation. But what we did manage to do was interview two of the biggest um, iDash users in, um, well, globally that we're working with as Extra um, and get their opinions that we've anonymized. And so the real-world use is presented by the partner, but the, the information that we're presenting here is based on two global companies and we just make sure we don't slip out who they are yes, during me. the 45 minutes. <laughs> All right. And following that, we have a couple of other sessions. We have another detailed uh, UI-driven session. What does the UI visualization look like uh, following your session at, at, at 3 o'clock? And then uh, we'll finish the sessions today with uh, my overall strategy session. It's uh, going to be 45 minutes, so there's only so much depth I can get to for every product. But I'm going to talk about where we are placing our bets, where we are investing, and we'll hit the highlights on every product area as to where the investments are going to be. Uh, we'll have follow-ups after that to get into the detailed roadmaps of each product. But at this session, you'll know very clearly the strategy behind our investment decisions and where our dollars are actually going. So I really encourage you to show up for that session as well. Thank you very much for coming here. And uh, do we have... Okay, don't miss. Last plug, don't miss the uh, user group reception right afterwards. There is a slight change in location. It's now going to be in Palm Foyer, third floor, right above Reef B. Am I right, Gene? Yeah. So please make sure that you show up there as well. Thank you very much for coming, and I hope you found this session valuable. Thanks.